Okay, so now we are coming to the second part and I must say uh, it, I decided to just more or less show you and discuss with you parts of the script. We will later on have some other slides or so. Uh, so this is really uh, this, the, these lecture notes where I was trying to have an approach to harmonic analysis strangely enough without Lebesgue integration, without measure theory, without topological vector spaces. So I called it a functional analysis approach. So maybe my first comment would be once more to repeat why are we doing functional analysis? Well, functional analysis is the theory of vector spaces which are not any more finite dimensional. They are kind of too big to be finite dimensional. That means if you try to use a finite basis and say, are 500,000 vectors enough? I would say no. I can show you 600,000 linear independent vectors because maybe the domain is continuous and I can easily write down uh, triangle functions with very tiny support and they are living on this joint interval so it's clear that their scalar product will be zero. So what are you doing if your dimensions are too big? And then one way that I like to say is uh, what were engineers doing in the old days when they were showing you the plans for your house? They didn't have 3D animation, so you could not take a picture and take a walk through your new house. How would they describe it? And the answer is clearly they would ma draw maps. They would say, if you look from above and if you look from the side, and as a mathematician, we would say, we take a projection on a two-dimensional subspace. Why two-dimensional? Well, because you can put it on paper and one-dimensional, a list of coordinates would not be very instructive or so. Um, but sure enough, to get a nice view of how the house looks from, from, I don't know, from somewhere nearby or so, then you would like to have a view from a different angle. So, is the uh, choice of the coordinate system important? Answer is no. So, going back to this situation, I'm living in a universe which is so big, but I can make pictures maybe because I've already learned linear algebra, I don't, I'm not afraid of 20 and 500 coordinates or so, or I'm thinking of modern digital media or so, I'm saying 8, eight million pixels are, are a quite good approximation for my picture, and I would say as a mathematician, it's still a finite number, so I'm trying to project the continuous variety of a two-dimensional function, which people call an image, onto a matrix of, of values. So you are discretizing, you are taking local averages, and this is finite dimensional. And we also know that we are able to have cameras which have low resolution, high resolution. So think now you are living in this infinite dimensional space and somebody says, if you want, I can give you projections of this to any finite dimensional subspace. Then what you need is clearly that you have to, be, to know what are the coordinates of my object of interest in these finite dimensional subspaces. So because they are finite dimensional subspaces, you have to prove using Han Bandach that you can do the projection just as a background information on the mathematical side. So you can always project an object on arbitrary finite dimensional subspaces. That's possible, at least with Thorne's principle. So if you have all these projections, uh, which, uh, what can you say about the coordinates in these projections? Well, the coordinates depend linearly on the input, so these are linear functionals. So if I'm asking you which coordinate system would you choose, you probably would say, well, I have to uh, take all possible coordinates. The single components of all possible coordinates are just all linear functionals. Because if somebody is giving you three linear independent linear functionals, you would be able to find a function space that they fit quite well or so. So somehow it's a functional analysis is just saying instead of saying I want to choose a fixed basis, I would allow myself to discuss in principle everything in general coordinates and because it doesn't make sense to look at all these 5 and 10 and 20 and 5 million dimensional subspaces, I'm just looking at them individually. So on the other hand it's quite quite common that we have learned whenever you are having a function space then you're looking for the linear functionals and you're doing linear functional analysis by studying the space through the linear functionals. 
And because mathematicians say, I have now a trick to make from a Banach space a new one, a dual Banach space, I can go on and take the second dual and the third dual and so, and Han Banach tells me I can embed the first one in the double dual, and sometimes I'm stuck there, so and Hilbert space is reflexive and so, so we can have a whole theory that is in the background of what we are doing. But to go back, because I claim that I'm having a simple approach, I mean, I'm trying to give you a wide uh, explanation of something which, if you are reducing it to the parts, is quite simple. We need vector spaces, we need norms for convergence. We have seen that norm spaces can be completed, and vector bounded linear mappings are the only reasonable ones. The unbounded ones, you essentially, I think, they exist, but they are not relevant for our purpose. So if you have a bounded linear mapping from a normed space to a normed space, you can extend it to a Banach space. And that's why I'm saying, if you learn how to deal nicely with Banach spaces, and you learn how to invent your own Banach space for a particular application, you maybe are in a good shape for, for some new applications. Uh, and it's maybe worthwhile to learn these techniques over learning all the details of topological vector spaces and so on. Of course, you needed to read papers and so on, and you may need it also. But I tried to, I mean, my, my choice was I want to stay with Banach spaces and see how far I can get. And I had not a big problem. I have other colleagues who say, well, you know, topological vector spaces are the right setting. Some people restrict them to the narrow subset of Banach spaces, and, but the, r the reality are topological vector spaces. If, for example, you are interested in the Schwartz space, it's very important to understand the topology, to know it's a nuclear Frisch space, and so on. It's, it's absolutely okay, it's my choice, and I'm trying to show you how far you can get with this restricted viewpoint. Okay, now, uh, fortunately, and that's why I can uh, do some of the things relatively quickly, uh, we have already the right symbols or so, and, and uh, I just uh, explain once more what, I, what kind of notations I'm using and what kind of norms are relevant. So the first thing is, uh, maybe another comment. Um, in, the, in the notes I have written RD specific, so when are things only possible for the Euclidean space, and what other things can be done in a general setting. The spirit of the lecture notes is such that, in principle, everything can be done on any locally compact abelian group. Uh, but sometimes it would be more cumbersome and I would have more terminology. And as soon as you have long explanations, people to whom you tell that's everything very simple, tell all, then it's not simple because it's so long, the explanation. So I think it makes things more crisp. And in the first round, you should, we should just think of real line d equal 1, uh, in the second line, because sometimes you have arguments like a compact subset is contained in an interval that has a left and a right limit point. If you go to the plane, a compact set is more or less like a circle that has infinitely many boundary points. So maybe if you have an argument that applies to RD, and the pictures that I draw usually are in R2, of course, on the blackboard or on the paper, uh, then you are having a very good approach. Okay, so. If somebody is giving you a locally compact abelian group, and maybe you think of d equal 2, so somebody is thinking, I want to understand Fourier analysis in two variables. And you can say, I'm interested in image processing, and the procedures there uh, are, are have to do with optics and point spread function, and they should be translation invariant. I mean, nobody will ask you where, when you look at the picture, where's the zero of the coordinate system. In the same way as you when you do audio, nobody is asking you what was the time when the piece of music was played. Uh, so uh, you have some starting point and you do analysis and the frequencies are a time independent description. That's so to say the importance why Fourier analysis is not just some transform, but exactly this invariance property with respect to translation is important. So now if you think image analysis, we're trying to do a contour detection or sh a sharpening an image, that should be translation invariant if it's linear. So if you're doing something on your image and then somebody says, no, I want to shift your image, then you could say, well, I could also do the apply the operation there, but doing the sharpening of the image here and moving the sharp image to the new position or 
moving this blurred image to a position, applying a sharpening procedure, that please should be the same. And of course, that, that's one of the reasons why these invariant systems are so important. But just to make it short, think of RD. And because uh, it is a topological group, I mean, we know what continuity means. And in the plane or RD, it's absolutely clear. A function is continuous. We will go into the complex domain by the Fourier transform. Oh, I forgot that. Okay. Uh, we go into the uh, Fourier domain. Ah, yeah, and therefore, we will get complex valued functions. And that's one of the reasons why we start with complex valued functions anyway. So CC of RD are the complex valued continuous functions with compact support, or you could say, which are just vanishing outside some sufficiently large ball. Uh, the Gauss function is not such a guy. Also, if you think in practical terms, the values outside the interval minus 3 plus 3 are so small that MATLAB is saying it's 10 to the minus 20. That's practically 0. So there's a distinction between analytic viewpoint and numerical viewpoint. But we are now here. It's really strictly meant in a strict sense. Now, as we have seen, the support of a function is just the closure of the set of, of the interesting values. And we will see later on that there will be a notion of support of a distribution. And the closure essentially has also to do with, the, with this property. When we define the support of a, well, when you have an ordinary function, we will also be able to consider it as a generalized function. Now, when we have a definition of a support of a generalized function, we will always get a closed set. And therefore, to have consistency, that is the reason why we put a closure here. But you can say it's the definition, you accept definitions as they are, and that's certainly fine. Now, we have already seen the translation operator, and I remind you once more that the translation <coughs> operator, the symbol of the action, is something that acts on the symbol. So of course, I will not write this square bracket all the time. But that's the spirit when you see a symbol tx of read it. The shifted function at the value ac set sorry, has the values of f at the point um, set minus x. So you're moving the values in some direction. And in the real line, if the shift parameter is plus 5, it really means moving 5 to the right, because you're taking values which are 5 to the left from the new position. That's why you have this. Uh, I didn't write it here, but somewhere you will find it. Of course, if I take a function and shift it by a certain amount, if the support is some interval or some, some set, then the support of the shifted function will be exactly the shift parameter plus the support. So this is one of the good properties. Um, most of the time, people use uh, this, some we call it the check operator or so, uh, so an inverse hat for the, for the flip operator. Now, we will also use the inverse Fourier transform. And sometimes people use the inverse symbol for the inverse Fourier transform, I mean the hat for the forward Fourier transform and the inverse hat for the in inverse Fourier transform. Therefore, I try to avoid the exact same symbol. And I'm using this check mark sign. It's a little bit unusual. I think I've seen it in a, in a book about the Haar transform or so, Haar measure, uh, construction of the Haar measure. So, so it's, it's clearly an involution, because if you take a function and I would say the graph that I would imagine to have here, the thing that I see is exactly the, the mirror. And if I turn it around, you would see the, the mirror, and I would see the original graph. So it's just flipping around the graph. Uh, what is the notation you use for f of minus? Is it a bar? No, what it's this uh, for the f of minus alone is just the check mark, this, okay. this symbol. Yeah, the, I will use the star also, but that will be in combination with conjugation. Right, and that's so right. Yeah, that, that's, so that, that's just a simple, you can say it's, it's a, a dilation operator with factor minus 1. But OK, then of course we have the modulation operator. And I will uh, just to mention how you c would do it in, uh, in, a dis in a general group. In the general group, you would have characters, so you would have uh, mappings from the group into the torus, which satisfy the compatibility law. And then you would say, I multiply with the character. Here you would say it's a concrete 
exponential function and uh, the assignment is if the parameter is s, so I modulate by the amount s, I would uh, multiply with the function e to the 2 pi so that everything is consistent with the other conventions with, with this here. Yeah, I mean you don't have to take notes if you, you can take notes of course, but we, you, everything will be in, in, in these notes that I have here. Now, uh, I mentioned already that dilation is specific and uh, so, uh, it's gone. Yeah, I say that will come later on. Let me see if I find it here. Yeah, uh, here, here I have a table, yeah. So we have translation operator, modulation operator, and then again, as I said to you, there is the stretching, and stretching is really, I always m m add that it's area preserving stretching operator. Later on, I would say mass preserving. Why is, is it mass preserving, or why, why do I use this? Because I will extend all these operators also to measures, including discrete measures. And if you have a Dirac delta, uh, you would say, what does it mean mass preserving? Well, if it's unit mass, it's going from position x to position rho times x, which is kind of, it's a, a Dirac measure sitting at a point x is something like a point mass concentrated at a point x, if you take that physical picture. If you're having several such point mass and you stretch your line, you would say, well, the point mass should be moving. And that operator is doing exactly this. If we extend it to measures, we will see that's how we do it. Yeah? But this, this is why this normalized version is the right thing. The other thing is, it's really meant stretching. If I stretch by a factor of two, the functions will be twice the width. Well, if the error is constant, then of course all the values have to shrink by a factor of two. So if you do a stretching to infinity, a rectangle function will get flat and flat, and you will say, oh, he's taking means over intervals long and longer. Sometimes you see integrals of the form from minus t to plus t divided by the lengths of this by 2t. So that, that's kind of the spirit. But the opposite of stretching is, of course, compression. As I said, in German, it's Stauchen. So it's stretching by one half means reducing the size of the rectangular function to half the size, and then it will twice the height. And then you have this usual picture of a Dirac sequence. We will discuss this in all detail, which is shrinking, and where somehow you can think that the limit is the delta. But that will be explained. Now. Uh, the D row operator is exactly the opposite, uh, where you have uh, the, the argument. And now you have to think uh, uh, that it is has the opposite effect. So ST rho, when rho is large, is stretching more and more. Again, in German, we have these for dilation, that's fine, or so, but we have the word drücken. So if I Drücke, uh, this meaning squeezing. Take the graph, you have a triangular function, and if I have d rho and rho is one uh, is two, then I compress the graph to half the size. So the values are constant, and d, d over 10 is just a very narrow spiky triangular function. The pi spike is not going up. So in terms of the support, of course, you have to think it's one over rho, and that's where sometimes you have to be careful. But uh, for example, I mean this, Compressed triangular functions are good for piecewise linear interpolation because you would say if somebody is taking a continuous function, you're sampling it, then you take this as an amplitude for a triangular function. So the piecewise linear interpolate is a sum of triangular functions which are more and more narrow, and that will be a useful viewpoint. Uh, you see here, not very well readable, this f star is my involution. That's consistent with your terminology. So it's m the flip combined with the conjugation and the ordinary, maybe I should make some room for the latte, and the bar only is the ordinary involution. So well, conjugation. Yes, conjugation, conjugation, yeah. Now uh, it's a bit boring, but um, I would say worthwhile to try to make a, a summary of all the properties. I have not listed all of them. Maybe we look first at the norm invariance properties that we have already discussed. Translations clearly are norm-preserving even if you take LP norms. Modulation operators don't change the absolute value, so L all the LP norms are not changed. ST rho and D rho, there are actually many different ways. I mean, you have taken the D rho more or less with, uh, as, a, as the first natural choice. 
For the L1 norm, you should take the ST row operator. If people want to do wavelet theory or just L2 theory, then you normalize with another square factor, which has also advantages uh, for the Fourier transform. So uh, I, I think one has to compromise on this. So that's why I put here, I was specifically picking out the ST row operator once more, mass preserving, support respecting, so the number row is telling you how much you stretch the support. Um, and it's good with respect to convolution and so on that we'll see. Whereas the dilation operator in this simple, in the sense of changing the scaling of the underlying basis and the values are kept un unchanged, is cha not changing the sup norm. Now, uh, there are many different rules uh, that, uh, that tell you essentially how things that you can already do with functions are compatible with these operators. And I personally find it very, very reasonable to make, study this list, try out a few of them. But when you do a proof, then instead of saying, well, I'm writing an integral and now I'm making a substitution and then I'm doing this. And so normally each step is applying an operator. So if you're saying I'm making a substitution because I compute an LP norm, I would say, well, you can skip that line by saying, the LP norm is clearly independent of the position. I have shifted the function from maybe there was a function here. I shifted to zero because there things look more simple. And that doesn't change the LP norm. So I found that many of the proofs that I see and also are such that I can refabricate uh, all the operator. Each line of the proof is one step applying one operator, one rule after the other. And at the end, it's rather compact. I mean, the proofs are getting more compact. And it's also more clear what you're really doing. So kind of what is the reason why this works? Because I think most of you have, have had the situation that more or less everybody has. You read an article. I mean, once one of my teachers was saying, well, I'm teaching this to you, but I have not understood it. I said, what does it mean? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I can follow the details. This and this and this is clear, yeah? Uh, but I cannot explain to you why we're taking this path. So it's like, I mean, I, you would guide me to, I mean, your colleague was guiding me to the beach. Maybe I find now back or so, but essentially, uh, why did we go the first time? Well, because he was showing me the way. So you read the proof, you learn something, and repeating this often and often, you get a little bit familiar. But if you are saying, well, here we have to turn right, here we have, to, otherwise we cannot cross the bridge and so on. That's, that's more or less what you make more explicit by these notations. Okay, sorry, so second line here. This rule, if you do a modulation operator and then you apply the Fourier transform, this is uh, this order, then it's the same as first applying the Fourier transform and then the shift operator. This is why the modulation operator is also called the frequency shift. This is what your electronic uh, uh, keyboard is doing when you hit the transpose key. So you're saying, well, I don't like, I don't know, B flat major or so, because there are so many black, black keys or so. I prefer to play with C major, because there are no black keys on the keyboard. So I play in C, but the sound is still, because my clarinet partner is having the other tone, transpose. So that's what the machine is doing. It's multiplying the, the output that it would get by some oscillatory term and that shifts the frequency, the pitch of the output. So in that sense it's really a shift on the frequency side and that's why the modulation operator is made such that this positive S is going to a positive T translation. So if you modulate upward, so to say, it's the operator is defi defined in such a way that it's going to the T translation operator on the Fourier transform side with the same size. We know about the asymmetry of modulation and, and, uh, and, and shift and the symmetry of the Fourier and inverse Fourier transform. Therefore, uh, I did not write down, oh yeah, here, no, I didn't write down the, I have to add, what happens if you take first translation and then the Fourier transform? And of course, the Fourier transform of a translated function is the Fourier transform of the original function modulated but with a negative exponent. You can say it's clear because the definition of the Fourier transform has a negative exponent, but that's more or less. Um, a very, very important thing for time frequency analysis where we are using so-called time frequency shifts, 
And time frequency shift is meant not in the order of symbols, but in the order of how we apply it. You take maybe a Gauss function, you do a time shift, and then you multiply with a pure frequency. That's what I call a time frequency shift. There are some other people who say a time frequency shift is where you write a symbol and then you write a time shift operator. Uh, but no, you write a time frequency shift by writing a time operator and a frequency shift operator and apply it to a function. So we would choose, of course, the opposite. So is it the same? And the answer is <coughs> almost, almost. Because in, in this way, um, if you are first, look at the left-hand side. You take something, if you write it out, you multiply with the pure frequency. So you have a, an envelope with some oscillator term. And then you're shifting both the function and the frequency. And then you have to take into account, well, this is, of course, shifting the envelope and shifting the pure frequency. But shifting a pure frequency, if you think in real terms, is shifting the phase, or in complex, you're rotating, and that's exactly some factor which depends on the amount. When you have systems, I mean, so-called Gabor frames or so, where you use this, then this factor, which is uh, unitary, so it's absolute <coughs> value one, really doesn't disturb you. So if somebody is working in a complex Hilbert space and says, I have found an uh, orthonormal basis, and then you multiply all the vectors of the orthonormal basis with random numbers from the unit circle, you will check it's still an or unitary basis because if this color product is zero, you can multiply it with anything. If it's one, uh, then having a same unitary term in front and on the back side will cancel out and it will be also okay. So that's why it's, well, making, um, I would say, time frequency analysis very much different from image processing. So we will see later on that what we are doing, we are transferring information from the audio signal to the spectrogram. You have seen this before. And then people think, well, just to apply image processing methods and then we go back. And there's a big catch in this idea. What we show is, of course, only the absolute value. There are phases. Uh, and uh, if you look at the shops of Bose or so, you can buy Bose or other things, uh, noise cancelling devices or so. Uh, can, you, can you have a negative pixel value? No. You cannot subtract pixels from your data. Or so. uh, but you can have noise which has exactly the same uh, 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 amplitude but in the opposite so that they cancel out each other. So the phase is very important and you just don't see it in the spectrogram but you have to, to take that into account that it's not just image processing. Okay, now I, I was mentioning that very simple changing of argument and dilation in that sense of multiplying the argument is harmless is, is okay, it's just compatible with pointwise multiplication and because the ST row operator is exactly going into the D row operator, that's my way of expressing the dilation theorem. It's clear that the ST row operator has to be compatible with convolution. You can also say I'm sitting down and doing the transformation on, on my own. It's, it's a kind of a two, three line proof or so, so it's, it's quite harmless. And of course you can play around with the, with the involutions. I was just writing the star, so the complex conjugate um, combined with the flip operator, it's compatible with, the, with this shift operator. Of course, kind of I would say this is a formula how I would write it on non-commutative groups. So the order is changed. Then I would say afterwards, but we are having a commutative convolution so you can go back. But this is the more natural way of obtaining it. Okay, now uh, we have seen that uh, the continuous functions are well defined and uh, then of course the na most natural domain is the continuous bounded functions. We have seen this is not only a Banach space but the Banach algebra. Uh, we can multiply two such functions and we will see that uh, uh, clearly the constant one is a unit. So this is kind of the big space and later on I will explain to you that it's a little bit too big for, for certain purposes or so. The main point of course is that the continuous function with compact support are not dense. I mean if you take just constant one and say I try to approximate it with a function with compact support, well the support may be huge, you can take any value, maybe you take plateau functions, but once you are out of the support the arrow is still 
full one. You have zero minus one is one. So you cannot approximate in the more norm sense. Of course, you can say maybe it's too strong. I should be uh, uh, happy or should be satisfied with a weaker form of convergence, which is actually quite useful. And that's the uniform convergence over compact sets. So you'll say, well, you have to, or I, if I claim that it's uniform convergent, then we can play the following game, which I, I like to have this kind of for, instead of for every epsilon the excess is delta or so, I'd like to make it a role game. So kind of I claim the plateau functions are uniformly convergent to the constant one over compact set. It means uh, anybody of you could, I mean I'm doing it myself now, everybody could give me a huge interval or a huge bounded ball or so and could say, well, I need good approximation on this big set. And it could be a, a tiny epsilon, positive for general purposes or so. And then I would say it's easy to apply uh, approximate constant one. I take a function which is plot, which is actually constant one on, on where you <coughs> require the high precision, and then you drop down because there I can do whatever I want. I'm only watching on this domain. So that would be a harmless, trivial thing where kind of even epsilon equals zero might work. It's bad for the exp for the general spirit of the of the concept, but this is okay. Okay, now. Uh, uh, one thing that I find quite good, and we might uh, try to discuss it in the exercises or so, is we have already seen <coughs> the concept of uniform continuity or so, uh, that this plays a role. So uniformly continuous functions are a closed subspace. Well, there are even a closed subalgebra, as we will see later on. But first of all, you have to think a little bit of, of the f about the following. If you have a bounded continuous function and you shift it, it's a bounded continuous function. So it is reasonable to measure the distance between the original function and the shifted version. And then you expect that if you shift it <coughs> a little bit only, maybe there's not the big difference. Now, again, it's very easy to fabricate a bounded continuous function which is not uniformly continuous. Uh, what do you think? What, what might be the idea of how can you kind of be uniform continuity? I mean, when you have a smooth function, how would you relate your epsilon to the delta? I would say you look at the steepness of the function. So if it's maybe piecewise constant, uh, it's the steepness. So if it's very steep, the delta must be small to have a small epsilon. If it's very flat, it's fine. So if you fabricate a function which has parts which are arbitrarily steep but still the overall thing is bounded, then you're fine. So take a triangular function at another place, another triangular function, and as you go to infinity, keep the height one, then it's bounded. Make the triangles on separate intervals, maybe from around <coughs> n, the width is one over n. This is getting very sharp. You shift a little bit and the from one point on, whatever epsilon you take, from one point on, the little triangles will be separated. And the difference will be a, a, a function which is, uh, is not small. So that's clearly not uniform. Uh, just a, another question, is it necessary, is a function, if it's uniformly continuous and if it's differentiable, has a continuous derivative, does it have to have a bounded derivative? And the answer is no. This is not a necessary condition. You could fabricate a function which is very much like this, but going down to zero. So kind of, you have this triangular function, but let them go to zero in height also. Then you would still say it's still steep. <laughs> but when you are having uh, some epsilon, all the tiny ones would not count. And the, so that's why you can have a function which is arbitrarily steep, but so small, I mean, it's getting faster small than it's steep. So that, that would be an example of a function which is uniformly continuous because it's decaying at infinity. We have seen C0 functions will always go to will be uniformly continuous. So if I have a, section, a selection of triangle functions going to infinity, but their amplitudes go to zero, that would be okay, that would be uniformly continuous. Now the point is of this lemma is you can say that if you have a function that's the fairly easy part, that is 
uniformly continuous, then you look at the difference Txf minus f, write it out. If this is uniformly small, you can get it uh, from the definition of uniform continuity, this will be small. But it's a double supremum, I don't go into the details. I have, I have written it out, but uh, so it's, it's clear that if you have this property of continuous shift, we call it continuous shift, so if a continuous bounded function doesn't deviate from its shifted versions for sufficiently small parameters, then it also has to be uniformly continuous. So we have a characterization within the big space of all bounded continuous functions. The uniformly continuous ones are the ones which have continuous shift. This is a useful criterion and I am using it, for example, to show, of course you could do it in, in a di direct way, that they are uh, forming a closed subspace. So suppose somebody is giving you uh, a sequence of uniformly continuous functions and they are uniformly convergent to a bounded continuous function is the limit again uniformly continuous and you can play with epsilon delta or so. Now if you look at the proof you it, it should look familiar to you because you have done something very similar. What I'm doing is I'm showing that this continuous shift property is preserved when you go to the limit. So my standard way of, of describing convergent sequences, a sequence fn of uniformly bounded continuous functions is convergent to a limit which I call f0. So we have to check, that's now equation 6, is this a good function? So we look at tx f0 minus f0 in the supnorm. What we know it can be arbitrarily approximated by good functions. And so I'm saying, well, I approximate it with high precision, that's the line above, by some function with number n0 with an approximation error of epsilon 1 over 3. So then I'm saying, okay, the shifted function is, well, I have a general function, but close by is the approximating function. Then I have the shift on the approximating function and then I have to go back from this. And it's exactly the proof that we had on the blackboard, except you were using the here a uh, continuous function with compact support and, uh, and here you were using a C0 function or so. So it's really the same proof. You choose first some epsilon here. I use now the argument that translation is isometric so the t can be cancelled off. If I would do it on the blackboard I would just erase it. So we have epsilon of third one, epsilon of third. I still have to do it here. That's now one fixed function which by definition, in your case, <coughs> by being compactly supported is okay and so on. So, so this is why we have a closed subspace. And it's another harmless exercise to say, well, a product of two uniformly continuous bounded functions is uniformly continuous. And it's the usual trick uh, that I would use that multiplication of the real number is, is okay. So if you multiply two real numbers, you would say approximate them by rational numbers and they are nearby. Why is a times b close to a prime b prime, let's say rational approximation? And then the claim is don't change two things at the same time, make an intermediate term. Go from a b to a b prime, from a b prime to a prime b prime. And then you have two terms and that's harmless. So multiplication is okay. Is it true that the product, or is it an ideal? So that would be the question. If you take an arbitrary bounded continuous function and you multiply with the uniformly continuous function, are you getting a uniformly bounded continuous function? Answer, clearly no, because you always can multiply constant 1, which is clearly uniformly bounded and continuous, with a nasty function, and then, of course, there's no chance to get into the space. So it's not an ideal, but it's a subalgebra. This is a bit in contrast to the space that we will use next. Uh, and. Uh, Probably I was jumping to no, well, let's see. Uh, that's C0. I will uh, probably jump through this. Give me a little moment. Yeah, here is here is a theorem summarizing some of the properties. So C B, the bounded continuous functions are a Banach algebra and, and so on. Actually, with involution it's even a C star algebra because the supnorm squared of a function is of course uh, the sup of the function pointwise squared absolute value. That's now we have already discussed number two. CUB is a closed subalgebra 
and I just repeat in words, C0 is the functions which are vanishing at infinity and this is not only closed but it's an ideal. If somebody is multiplying a function which is getting small at infinity with another which is bounded, well small times bounded will be small. You can control it and will be small. Um, I think we can yeah, maybe, maybe this is more or less what, what uh, we also had already in the discussion. How can you describe the C0 space within the bounded continuous function? And the answer is, it is just the closure of the functions with compact support. So that's of course something where maybe the proof in, uh, in a general situation is more difficult than in the real line. In the real line you would say, I look at the function decaying at infinity, how can I approximate with the continuous function? By definition I say there's some interval, the big values are all in the interval, only the rest is small. So I cut off and then I make some continuous drop off. So in the general situation you would maybe use Urison lemma or so and have some other procedure to, to kind of get rid of the discontinuity. But uh, my way of doing it would be the following. Um, maybe we can see it, I would say I multiply my, my C0 function with plateau functions. So again let's, let's, take w let's put ourselves in the situation of the plane. Uh, I'm thinking of big cakes which have a flat plateau and smooth boundaries going down like this, but supported on the plate so to say. And you can have the plateau bigger and bigger. So if you multiply a bounded continuous function which is small at infinity anyway with such a plateau function, what you're getting is clearly a function which is only zero where the plateau is non-zero. So it must be a function with compact support. And again, we have seen more or less the same argument in, in the previous talk. If you look inside the plateau, the product of the plateau with your function is the function value. So there is zero error inside. If you look outside, the difference is the difference between one times the function and plateau value. So it's the function f multiplied with one minus the plateau. Well the plateau is reasonably taking values between zero and one, so it's going down. So the difference is something which is also at most one. I mean near the, um, it will be one far away and will be even smaller near the boundary. So you have multiplied the function which is certainly small, smaller than epsilon outside with something which is not larger than one, so it's also small. So kind of instead of sharp cutting and fiddling around with how to extend a function living on a compact domain using topological arguments, my way of, of viewing it would be use what we will actually see is an approximate identity for C0. A system of function, we have more or less also discussed it pre previously, of functions which is getting larger and larger support on larger plateaus, but each of them having bounded. And if the question is, now if I have really a locally compact abelian group, then you have to go into a course on topology and then Orison, Lemma and these things will tell you you have such plateau function and uh, you don't have to produce them numerically, so to say. Okay, now uh, uh, I have to remind you, uh, but only very, very shortly, that uh, I'm implicitly now using things material from the uh, lesson on Banach algebras. I don't have to repeat it. A Banach algebra is clearly some algebra where the algebra is compatible with the norm. The only side comment I make, some people allow a constant here, but in the footnote you will read, you can replace, I mean this is something which is not homogeneous. So if I rescale everything, meaning I multiply both sides with C, then I would see that C times the norm of the product is less than C times the A norm times C times the B norm. And then I would say, okay, the new norm is C times the old norm, and rescaling a norm is an equivalent norm. Therefore, there is no loss of generality to assume that in the Banach algebra, the norm is really sub-multiplicative. It would be far too much to have the property of complex numbers that it should be exactly multiplicative. You have to have estimates, um, but that's, that's what we know. Okay, so um, we have the D-row operator here uh, and yeah, 
there are some, some, some formulas describing the interplay between the different operators. So for example, you might want to stretch a function, or maybe, maybe in the other way around, looking at this left-hand side. Uh, first you shift a function, so for example, have a Gauss function, then I shift it to the position 3, and then I rescale everything by a factor of 2. So everything that's happening at 3 will now sit at 6. And it will also broaden the function, because everything is twice the size. Of course I can take the Gauss function and broaden it here, but then I have to think, how much do I have to shift it? And I have to shift it not by 3 only, but 2 times 3. So this is more or less this effect of dilation and translation uh, are compatible is, is this. You have the same formula for, for the stretching operator. Each stretching operator, I mean you see that it's the same D-row, it's not changing the D-row. So the D-row, if you do stretching, it's only that you have to adapt the scaling parameter. That's maybe also interesting for people doing wavelet theory or so, where you say, I can, I mean, the claim is, or the, the interesting thing is, you can take a function, a wavelet, and uh, by appropriate shifting and scaling, you get an autonomous system. So and one natural explanation is that I see quite often is, you take the wavelet function, and you have compressed versions of it, and very tiny ones, which are good for representing sharp edges, and you have very flat ones. And then of course, let's say we compress by a factor of two, whereas the original one is shifted by integer lattice, then of course the smaller one you have to shift by half integers or so. So it's kind of, I have to think now that the narrow guy has to sit on the final lattice or so. I prefer, and, and more or less using such a formula in, in, my, in the back of my mind, I'm saying, for me it's much better to say, well, what is a wavelet system? You have a building block and you move it at the integer lattice. These are kind of, this is the ground state or so. And then you're taking the whole collection and you're playing harmonica like this, you're stretching the whole line. And clear enough, the guy who was sitting at 10, if I compress by a factor of 2, is now sitting at 10 over 2 at 5. Of course I could say 5 is the position that I get by jumping 10 times half, half steps or so. But if I want to, to, to describe the system, I find it better that I say wavelet systems are are desi designed by two labels and depending on, on the question that I have. Either I want to work with the parameters, then I would say it's in the third scale number 120, or I would like to say it's very small and it's here. And there's n that's not exactly the same and the, the, the difference is just very natural here. Of course you can flip a shifted function and that means shifting in the opposite direction. You can flip twice, then you have this, so it's really an involution and uh, such exercises are really, you should really try to do it because I know from experience that at the beginning you, you're, one tends to be confused or so because most of the time you think you have to operate on the values or so. And so uh, this, such, um, I, I will try to read this instead of writing it on the blackboard to you. Here it's really, I'm applying, and therefore I made a square bracket, I'm applying to a function f a shift operator and then a scale operator. So I want to rescale a shifted version of the function. So in order to find out what the composition of tx with d rho is, and I would like to just show, I can interchange the two or the operators and find the right translation parameter. So I have to say, what is the operator? Well, you describe an operator by putting some function. Well, what is the new function? It has some values. So the point is, if for every function, let's say continuous function or so, and every possible argument, I can write something which is, at the end, you will see it's this tx d rho of f at the same argument, I can take away the argument. But that's true for every function, that means the operator is doing the same on all the functions. And in that way, it's very, very gen general. Okay, so. The point is, you have to read it as d rho of tx means the shifted version of f is just some function. And I put brackets around it so that it's clear that, of course, when you uh, write symbols in a chain, you work from inside to outside. So what is the dilated version of that function g that represents the t of x? 
you take that function and I just copy the t of x with the brackets and say instead of the argument set I have to use the argument row time set. So that's why I have the shifted here. Now I have to apply the rule. This is a function having a certain name. Whatever argument you put, that's row set in this case, I have to use it not at the position row set but row set minus x because there is a tf here. So now I have redescribed it. I can also start with some speculation what comes out and work from the backside. I know already more or less what I want to do. So I would like to have the operator row inside so I uh, pull out the row. And in order to keep this constant, of course, I have to compensate the row outside by one over row inside. That's just the harmless trick of rewriting the argument in a way that says there is some argument multiplied with row. So it's a function where instead of using it the argument set minus x and so, I'm applying it row times the argument. So it's that same function. It's d row f was the function name. But the argument is what is behind the row. So it's set minus x over row. And then you would say, okay, clearly this is not the continuous argument, but the argument minus something. So it's a shifted parameter of this. So in this way, we have shown a typical way of these formulas. And all the others are more or less in the same spirit or so. And what you also see is uh, once you have uh, this property of maybe norm invariance or so, and, and these rules with convolution or so, you're saving writing integrals all the time. You're doing it one to establish the formulas and from then on I'm using this more or less symbolic. So I'm, I'm developing a, a shorthand notation for what I would do normally by doing the integrals or so. But I'm having better control because the symbols tell me what I'm doing here. Okay, now uh, we have heard uh, that uh, what uh, that, that L1 does not have a, an, a, an, a unit because if it had a unit it would have to be constant 1 on the Fourier transform side which is in contradiction with the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma which says a Fourier transform of an L1 function has to decay at infinity and so we and um, I, th I took C0 for many reasons so at the beginning it was just it's a good illustration of a algebra uh, with simple pointwise multiplication where one can explain the concept of pointwise above of bounded approximate units. Because uh, it's again clear C0 does not contain the unit function and that would be the only candidate. And therefore everything that I understand here I can try to translate into more abstract terminology and can try to see what happens if I use that terminology on L1. That's more or less a strategy I'm pursuing. Uh, and uh, I'm probably not going through this uh, proof, but I would like to mention the following fact. How are approxi bounded approximate units look like in this concrete Banach algebra? So first of all, boundedness in the supernorm sense means simple ordinary boundedness. And since the unit has norm one, it's reasonable to try and it's doable in most cases to try with norm 1. So somehow all the functions that we are looking for should be C0 functions which are between, if it's real valued, between 0 and 1. If it's complex value, the absolute value should be between 0 and 1. So if you have uh, uniform convergence, it also has to be uniform convergence for all, for any function that you give to me. So uh, what could be good test functions, what you, where you would like to know uh, that you apply it and it is convergent. And I would say, again, plateau functions. You could give me a function which is constant 1 on a large set and then it goes to 0. This is a function which is continuous going with compact support. It's C0. So if you have an approximate unit multiplying that abstract system of function with this plateau function, it has to become small. Well, something multiplied with a plateau and being small must be small itself. So it must be close to one in that sense. So, sorry. so if the difference is small, it must be close to one. So it's necessary that if you have an abstract ap approximate unit that you're having, I, I use this abstract notation of uh, alpha. I will give a comment on this in a moment. So that uh, 
this uh, family is convergent uniformly over compact sets. Now assume the opposite. Somebody is telling you that he has a family of functions and as you progress, as your parameter is getting better and better, uh, uh, it's getting more and more close to one on, on the compact sets. Then I would say, test it now on the continuous function with compact support. They don't see the trouble outside. So they say, on my support everything is fine. So I observe for functions which are compactly supported, everything is fine. Now guess how you prove that a general C0 function is also approximated. You would say a general C0 function is some function which, the part which is important, which is compactly supported, there's no problem, and the rest is small. But if you apply a bounded approximate unit, whatever it's doing, with something which is small, it's small. So it's this standard trick. If you test an approximate unit on a dense subset, you can extend it, and this trick will come so often that I don't want to repeat it. Uh, uh, I have here a formulation uh, which is kind of more general, uh, and it's about operators. And I want to tell you a little bit here about convergence of operators. So we have seen that uh, when you are dealing with linear mappings uh, from function between function spaces or Banach spaces, then it's very reasonable to assume continuity, which actually is equivalent to boundedness. Uh, and we have also seen that you can define the size of an operator by taking the operator norm. Roughly speaking, you take the unit ball of the Banach space in the domain and you see how the, 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 it must become some bounded set, but how big it is. I was mentioning in the morning session that in the case of plane R2 mapping, um, a 2 by 2 matrix is a linear operator from R2 to R2 and the circle is going to an ellipse. And then the size of the ellipse is, of course, uh, the size of the main axis. So uh, the operator norm is just how big is the ellipse. And now we're having this more general concept. Now, if you have now several operators, that's now a, a shift in the attention, you can ask, are these operators approximating a limiting operator? And then, of course, you can say, OK, I have a norm on the space of operators. I, I, I watch what happens uh, by looking at the difference between my operator, uh, the limit operator, or the candidate for the limit operator, and my approximating operator. But that turns out to be a quite uh, strong concept or so. And uh, I would say, roughly speaking, the idea could be, following up on my previous story about functional analysis, maybe I'm saying, take the whole unit ball is not so good, Let's take a finite dimensional subspace and take the unit ball of the finite dimensional subspace and watch what happens there. Is it convergent? Can I see convergence? Then I take another finite dimensional space. That's more or less what you are doing when you do a strong operated convergence. So you're saying more or less you take a single vector or finitely many linear independent or dependent ones or so. You're watching what happens on the individual vectors. And that's a very natural, very important concept. And now uh, you see I'm putting this abstract notation of alpha. And uh, I like, I must say, I like nets very much. So in general topology, you, you will use them or so. Uh, but I also think that in, in, in any analysis course or so, you're using so many nets without calling them nets, uh, so that I would like to, to kind of ignore the technical details Something a net is something where you have an index set, and it's not that you can say the standard argument for sequences. A sequence is convergent. Well, what does it mean? That you give me an epsilon, and then all the elements with large enough numbers are inside the epsilon ball, and there are finitely many outside or so. So, uh, well, the natural numbers are very nicely organized. And whenever you have two numbers, they are either before or after n0. And that, uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, usually I'm saying take a consumer report. Uh, I don't know, maybe about computers. I want to buy a new computer. I look up in the internet and, and I want to get an idea. 
clearly there is some ranking. If somebody is selling a computer with a larger hard disk and a better, better performance at a cheaper price, I will say this is better. Uh, um, in that market, I might not have what I need in this abstract setting. That I would say, I would like to have the price of the cheap one and the hard disk of the big one and the memory and so. But that would be the idea that if you have an index set where with two indices you can have a joint refinement. So a typical index set would be somebody is throwing infinitely many points in the plane and you are supposed to sum the sampling values of these values. So you would say, oh, it's a problem. Bec or you would say it's a countable set, I, I take an enumeration. Well, for sure if 20 people are in the room, each of you would have a different enumeration. So suddenly we have the question, is the enumeration relevant? And there you have this unconditional convergence issue. So is the order, the condition to, s to, or to, s to, to add things in a particular way, is it relevant or not? And uh, well, a good way of, of getting rid of this independence of the counting is to say, well, I grab 100 points and sum them up. And you're telling me it's not enough, add another 51 or so. And then we can easily talk about the situation where we we'll say, well, if you sam sample at all the important points, I mean, there is maybe a, a bump function. And so if you take all the samples in the area where it's large, and then you stop taking the samples because the rest is so small, it's just noise or so. Then we are in the situation that you say, well, the, set, the index set of possible sampling operators are all finite subsets of our points. If somebody says, I have sampled here and have self here, the joint refinement, the union of two finite sets is finite. So this collection of all finite sets is a good index set. And to say the infinite sum is conversion now with this abstract viewpoint is you just say, well, if somebody is giving me an epsilon, if I take the most relevant 150 points and you mark them, the finite set, then you can take these plus whatever you like any finite set containing the relevant points and you add them up, you will find you get something which is practically the same. There is just an epsilon. So what I sh explained to you is more or less a Cauchy net. Another thing which, uh, just to make it short, we should probably come to an end, is uh, Riemannian sums. We have learned that a fun continuous function is having a, a is integrable, a continuous function on the interval is integrable uh, by, by, by the method of, of Riemann. And what does it say? Well, if you have two Riemannian sums which are fine enough, that's the only quality criterion, and you take any points there, then uh, you will be sure that uh, they are close to some number, and this number will be called the integral or so. Well, take the collection of all the pairs where you say this is the decomposition and this is the vector of sampling points. The quality actually doesn't take care of the points, where the points are, but you would say quality good enough means the maximal gap size is fine. If somebody tells you I have two Riemannian sums, what is the best joint quality? Well, you take the union, the joint refinement or so. So the collection of Riemannian sums is a perfect example where you say as you ha we have seen, operators can be, in a special case, linear functionals. So you are taking linear functionals on the space of continuous functions. The linear functionals are actually very easy. You are taking the weighted sum of xi1, xi2, xi n. So you're sampling. Each sampling is a linear operator, linear functional, sorry. You're taking some weighted linear combination. And the index set is these strange partitions and you're saying if they're fine enough then they are close to the limit. Yeah, this is exactly a procedure. So uh, I would say uh, if you take this abstract lemma that I wrote here, you have a bounded net of operators on the Banach space. Uh, uh, then you have some statement. Yeah, okay, I will not go through the details here. It's uh, too, too late now. Uh, but that is a situation where you can say, well, it would be that somebody tells you, I have tested Riemann integrals on differentiable functions. And because we have Weierstrass theorem, we know every continuous function can be, a pro or I may have just tested on polynomials, yeah? And we know Weierstrass theorem says, I, I know 
that uh, the Riemann integral works fine on polynomials or so. And I know that Rajstras, I can approximate them uniformly. Now these Riemann ensembles are such a strange, weird family. Well, a, I call it a net, but they're uniformly bounded. Each Riemann ensemble can be controlled by the size of the function times the length of the interval. And I have convergence of this on, on a dense subset, and the claim is I can extend it to the whole thing. This here, the, this lemma is actually slightly different. It says, if I observe it on one point, and then on another point, I can observe it, can by induction do it on finite sets. And everything that can be well approximated by finite set means compact sets, it's working also. But that's not, not, not relevant here. So that would be, if you give me a, uh, what is it called, a uniformly uh, equicontinuous family of functions. So many functions, all continuous, but you can use the same epsilon for uh, the, yeah, the same delta for the same epsilon. So as soon as you know that you can use a good epsilon delta relationship, you don't have to know anything about the function. You can use the same refinement measure for all the Riemannian sums to get the same approximation quality. So it's just getting away from the question of for each individual function you have to watch how the Riemannian sums approximate the limit. Now, if you have two functions, maybe you have to wait longer, if you have three more. But if they are kind of equal in terms of continuity quality, and that's what the concept of uniform equicontinuity. It's just saying for all of them, for the same epsilon, the same delta applies. That's on the only thing that counts, and that would be a, a special case of the lemma here. I will probably not go into the details, because uh, just announcing for tomorrow, the key point for tomorrow will be introducing convolution for bounded measures uh, in a way which is uh, quite close to the practical viewpoint of engineers, but it uses only Banach algebra methods and a little bit of functional analysis. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>